right, all right, all right. Welcome back to IT Security Labs, everybody. I'm very excited today. I'm going to show you a few things. Uh, first of all, if you are new to this channel, I'm going to show you our network topology diagram. We'll be attacking a Windows 10 machine and it's joined to a domain. So after our last live stream, I found out that it's very important that we know how everything is connected and what is actually happening. So today, I'm going to be showing you how exactly everything is connected. Then we'll attack this Windows 10 machine here. It's joined to a domain, so we can use this Windows 10 machine to jump and attack the domain controller that's in this lab environment. And that's going to be very important, especially for those who manage Active Directory. This is how attackers usually get on your network. If Windows 10 client, someone gets fished, you're running an application on some random server. So we'll attack this machine, gain some access on this system, through a vulnerable web application. Then of course, we'll try to enumerate the domain for like users, uh, administrators and things like that. And also this is very important for the OSCP. I believe that this is how the exam is going to be set up where they will have a domain controller and two clients or three clients in the exam. In fact, I know it's two because a blog post that I read last time said they will have two Windows 10 or Windows 10 and Windows Server machine connected to a domain controller and you need to gain initial foothold. The most logical thing is one of these clients is going to be vulnerable. So what you're going to see today is going to closely give you a good idea of how then do we compromise the domain controller when a client is compromised. So that's what we are doing here. ABT, Roit, and my next 12, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for joining. Um, so, quick overview of our network diagram, and if you if you're having any issues hearing me, let me know. But so far, what we call the internet here is going to be your home network. You have a firewall. In this case, I actually have a UDM Pro firewall. This is like the ubiquity uh, firewall. It's overkill. You don't need this. You need PFSense, or you don't even need a firewall in that case. But I have a firewall. And this closely re resembles real networks in the real world. You have firewalls in place, so I do have one right here. Then, of course, I have a layer 3 switch. In this case, I'm mirroring traffic from my attacker machine to Secure Onion Intrusion Detection System. So this is the system that is right here. And this is an intrusion detection system. So far, it hasn't detected anything yet. But according to our diagram, if there's any attack traffic that is coming to our Windows domain environment, we should be able to see it right here. That's just port mirroring. I've talked about that on this channel so many times, and you can watch some of my videos on that. But of course, we have um, Windows 10 client, which is running a vulnerable web application. Then of course, a uh, domain controller. And in addition to that, for host-based in, in, intrusion detection system, which is something you really need to know as well, you need to know network-based intrusion for Zeke and Surikata here, but you also need to know a uh, host-based intrusion detection system, which is in this case Splunk using some um, Windows event forwarders and things like that. So let me see here. Um, I forgot to add BT to be my moderator. I'm seeing some uh, funny business going on. All right, so this is our lab network. It's all running on a Dell R720, which is back there on that uh, server rig. And it's super simple to set up. BT as a video that he, he did use. So if you're curious, like, oh, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? This is the setup. And if you understand a little bit about networking, I hope this will give you an idea of how things are set up. One most common question that I get by people is, oh, why is your Kali Linux already behind your firewall? Uh, this is just me cheating. This Kali Linux should be out here and the port should be allowed through the firewall. I didn't want to monitor all the traffic that is coming here. I only wanted to monitor one port. In this case, that's coming just from my attacker to here. It doesn't matter in my lab because I would have opened the port anyway via the firewall to this. So that's the, that's the explanation there. But really the idea here is we are going to be attacking a web application that is sitting here and hopefully we'll be able to uh, see what's going on. So if you just joined us, this right here is the machine that we're attacking Windows 10. It's joined to a domain. Every time a domain gets compromised, usually people don't attack the domain controller directory. 
they go to a client, then the client lets them in. And so that's what we're going to try to do today. Attack a, a client that's joined to a domain, gain initial access, then of course after that, uh, be able to see if we can uh, compromise the system. All right, so that's enough about the diagram. I know it's very important for us to understand, but le now let's go to the real detection lab. If you want to set this yourself, please use uh, this detection lab GitHub here. BT already posted a link to a video as well, but this is the original for detection lab. If you want to make your Active Directory vulnerable, again, <laughs> use uh, where's hell here. The creators for both of these uh, projects are really great. And what I do is I shop around, I use their, you know, already proven. I spoke to Chris Long, I sent him a message. I said, hey, is it cool if I show people? And he was like, really? Go ahead and do it. For me, I use the ESXi because I'm running in VMware ESXi. So just follow these instructions. They're very straightforward. If you want your Active Directory to be vulnerable, I just tweeted today and the creator for this uh, Where's Hell really thinks it's really cool stuff. So make sure to just run this one here. Uh, the scripts here, they will set up all kinds of Active Directory attacks. And I don't know about you, but if I were going for the OSCP, I would go through this list of attacks one at a time and make sure that I have a good understanding of what they are. Like abusing access controls, keep roasting, AS roasting, you know, everything. You can set them up automatically using a PowerShell script and there's instructions for, for that. What I have done though is combining these two projects, I also make the web application vulnerable. So what you're going to see today is my work where I went and I installed a vulnerable web application from Exploit DB, then I'm going to exploit it. Because you need to somehow break into that environment. And that's also very important. So I'm going to add value by showing you how to break into places, then you can take it from there. All right, that's more talking than I, I, I would like to actually do. I don't like to talk too much. I like to jump in here, but it's very important that we understand what, what we are going to be doing. So today's attack is just mostly um, initial access. And then we, we just play around once we get to a client. I'll show you what you can see on an Active Directory. It won't be really conclusive after that, but we need to break into a client first. So first, let's do an nmap minus SV minus SC. Do I want to do all ports? No. So I already have an IP address. So if you are doing a pen test, they might tell you like, hey, here's a section of the network that we would like you to uh, scan. If you're an attacker, you'll probably be coming from the internet. You'll probably just run into a public IP address because the service will be exposed to the internet during your enumeration, looking for domain uh, services and everything. You're going to actually see uh, the IP address. So regardless, IP address is going to be provided to you. All right. So as you can see here, we scanned our victim. I always tell you that, you know, this scan is not conclusive. This scan is really a lazy man scan. You need to do a full TCP scan using minus P dash dash. You need to do a UDP scan and then uh, look at both. Don't just rely on the scans that I'm doing right now. I don't have all day to run both, but I'm just telling you this scan here does not catch everything. All right, we have port 21. It's FileZilla and we have a version. When you see something like this, what you can do is quickly grab the version for FileZilla, right? This could be an easy uh, win for you. I guess Google doesn't want to work in this machine. Go and figure out what version of FileZilla is running. In this case, I don't know if this version of FileZilla is actually going to give you anything really, because uh, I haven't checked it. It might be. So if I share the machine with you in the comments, um, try to see if you can exploit this, but I don't think there's anything. FTP, usually if there's anonymous, you will see, it will tell you right here, like, hey, you can get in with anonymous. You can also try, even if it doesn't tell you in the banner, that, hey, I would like to try anonymous, but NMAP already tries it for you. Today is very simple. We have port 80, which is running. You will notice, which is very important, Compared to last week, the number of ports that are open here are different. We don't have port 
53 for DNS. We don't have a bunch of uh, Kebros port 88 open or anything like that. If you look at this, you can tell this is not a domain controller. Because if this was a domain controller, there will be port 88 here. There will be Kebros or LDAP ports open here. In this case, we don't have those. But we can tell that it's already a Windows machine. You know, being able to quickly get to a certain place of like, oh, maybe this is a it's this type of machine just helps. It puts you at ease. If you are like you're looking at this and you have no idea whether it's a domain controller or not, you need more practice because obviously we don't have domain controller ports open here, like for Kebros or LDAP or anything like that. So I'm going to move to port 80. And right away, if you go to 192.168.38. Dot one nine nine. Looks like we, we got redirected. Something is coming up. And we see a simple chat uh, chat application. Let me move myself so you can see here. I'm in the way for something very important. This is like the easiest stuff. Like if you are doing some enumeration, by now this should be like a part of your muscle memory. I land in some random web page. I start looking at what is it? My first idea is, is it a CMS? What, what the hell is this thing? In this case, it's a simple chatbot application. I found this from Exploit DB. It's very simple to um, install. It's installed on a XAMPP server. And uh, if you don't know how to do that, I might uh, show you in, in a different video. But I just installed XAMPP. I installed this application. This application is vulnerable to an exploit that you're going to see soon. What we're about to learn here is how we approach this. First of all, it's just saying, hey, ask me. Hi, John. Hi, I'm John, chat box application. Okay, it's for chat. Hello, John. Oh, John actually responds and wants to talk to me. How's it going? What, can, what, else, what else can I do? Okay, so John doesn't understand what I just asked to understand question marks. John doesn't even understand the word <laughs> help. So we do have a web applica uh, chat application. Uh, people can customize this chat bot to answer common questions, right? You are an attacker. You're being asked, hey, break into this thing. We don't know anything about it, but it's, it's exposed to you via the internet or via whatever. You didn't have to authenticate to interact with it. You can try simple things like, you know, maybe cross-site, uh, scripting to see if this thing can be uh, abused. Or you can look down here. It says copyright 2022. Okay. So it looks like we are running the latest version of this thing. What we're interested in is, is uh, this chatbot name right here. Version 1. When you hit that, this is gold. So I now know what the what, what is this thing is. I can just plug this thing in Google and figure out what is it? I actually haven't Googled this thing, so <laughs> give me a give me a break if I can find it right away, but it should work. Oh really? All right, I found it from ExploitDB. So some you need to, uh, of course, if, if you really look this thing up, you will actually find it. You just need to make sure that your search really works. You will find the uh, source code for it. It's probably this, this one. Or this one. Yeah, this one. It's right here. You see, it's the exact text that we actually saw in our uh, footer in our web, website here. All the way at the bottom here. We are just enumerating, right? So know that Active Directory is secondary. Someone has to get into your uh, application. In this case, we have an, a, an example version of it here. This looks exactly like the one that we are running. Uh, let's see.
yeah, this is, a, this is an example version of the one that we have. And this one is not safe, but it's the same. If you go to exploit DB here, in fact, you don't even need to search. It's from 2022. The vulnerability that we are looking at here uh, is from <laughs> this year. So it's this one, Simple Chatbox Application 1. We do have a few of them. Uh, this is from the 18th. That's a few days ago, actually. I just found this today. I was like, oh, that looks fun to play with. So I just picked it up, but this is from a few days ago. Remote code execution, that's what we like. We love remote code execution. That is like the poor man's remote shell, uh, reverse shell is from remote code execution. The OSCP is for beginners. Most of the time you will see very simple things like this. They will not try to make your life hard where you have to string too many things. It's silly things like this. We also have, uh, of course, a uh, blind SQL injection here. Which we might actually try. I didn't try this. All right, they're talking about SQL map. I don't, I don't usually use SQL map, but they're talking about SQL map. So we have SQL injection if we don't know any login information, but we also have, of course, a remote code execution, which is very exciting. And here comes another simple trick that I think everybody needs to be able to do, which is if someone gives you a proof of concept, you should be proficient enough to just read what they're talking about and be able to execute. You literally are not thinking. You're being told, hey, by the way, this is how this thing works. You don't even need to figure out. You're shown like, hey, this is how it works. So how do we read this here? Uh, this was discovered on the 18th of January. It's a proof of concept. You can request, send a request as a base user. And it says you can upload a PHP uh, shell as a bot avatar or user uh, it is this one here, user avatar or image. It doesn't get any easier than this. If you see a reverse shell that you can get as a regular user, the first thing that I'm now thinking is, okay, I have an application. So far, I just saw a bot that is just allowing me to chat. Somehow, I need to find a login page as a user and see if I can um, change the bot avatar. Oh, right now here is a bot avatar. I just clicked on the bot avatar. Let's see what happens. Nothing, it just takes me home. So I need to log in somehow to this thing. That's what I'm thinking, right? Because so far there might be more directories or not. I don't know, but I have to summon a tool. Go Buster or Nikto or Derb. Let's use um, Derb. Because I believe Derb will find this. So some of you might be thinking, well, how do you decide between using Derb and using GoBuster and the other ones? I use Derb as a simple wins kind of thing because Derb uses common.txt, which is not a very thorough word list. But at the same time, if there are easy things to see, on this uh, website, Derp is going to pick it up. Like right now, of course, is an, an, is an attack. I'm very excited about seeing an admin page. You could have easily guessed in ad, that an admin page should exist, but I like that Derp picked an admin page right away because I like that. So let's go to such admin. This bot doesn't seem to talk much. So we go to the admin page. I hope I'm not still signed in. I should have signed out. All right. Let me sign out. This is for my little test earlier. This is what you will be faced with. I would expect that anyone um, who is like interested in pen testing should become like, this is like the easiest, like the low hanging fruit of any type of testing that I'm showing you here. There's nothing anything, any, anything special here. When you are faced with a login page, there's a few things that you need to do, right? You're an attacker, you can first admin, admin, admin password. I do this like a couple of times. I try the obvious, like admin, admin, admin password. They will fail. I'll try SQL injections here. In this case, uh, ExploitDB actually said we have a SQL injection. 
I'm tempted to go back there. But using our proof of concept here, software link, ExploitDB did give us a link to the original software. So I would like to go there. If you can uh, get a GitHub repository of the software that is running or the original source code, you are in business. Because then you can just read the source code and see how the thing works. In this case, you can download source code from here. But <laughs> of course, it, it, it will explain like, oh, here's how it's done. And um, it will give you some instructions. I, I think I read somewhere some instructions on how this thing is actually set up. So here is the original source code. And if you want to install this yourself, just follow this, how to run it. It's very straightforward. I installed this in like 20 minutes and attacked it at the same time. So it says, oh, by the way, here's admin access. A lot of people will give you the default credentials. So before you do anything, figure out, are there cre default credentials for this thing? Uh, is it vulnerable to SQL injection? Uh, can I do cross-site scripting? Is there a local file inclusion? Those are like the obvious things that you and I, people who are just, you know, learning, especially for the OSCP or just for CTFs, are easy wins. And usually when you find them and you have done them a few times, you know. So admin, admin one, two, three. Well, t get, turns out that's, that's what we have here. I, I just installed the, the thing and left admin one, two, three. You'll be very surprised how many people out there do not change default credentials. It's silly, but that's what happens. And as, an, as a pen tester, you are tasked by a company to, hey, test our security posture, test default credentials, do your client a favor, test the default things and see if they actually changed it. Some people might not have good uh, hygiene there. All right, so now that we are in, we can see if the exploit actually works. Another thing that you can do if you don't have default credentials, see if you can create a user on that website. Does it allow you to create a user? And you can just create a regular user and see if you can exploit that way. So there's a few ways and with more practice, you will get there. So you want to make sure you try as many things as you can and you are you know, proficient and you can just think very quickly uh, when you're presented with things. All right, so now that we're in, here comes the challenge. Let's read the damn uh, proof of concept. It's a bunch of uh, lines of code, so it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but if you have sent requests using especially burp suite and uh, even curl commands and using post and uh, get requests, you know that this is just, you know, basic responses from a, a, a website. So what happened here? How do we read this? First, it says you can upload the PHP shell file as a bot, as, as bot avatar or as user avatar or image. So you can upload any images, PHP. I mean, it, it doesn't get easier than this, like I said. So all this is telling us, hey, upload a PHP shell as a bot avatar and you'll be in business. That's all there is to this thing. So we're actually going to do that right now. Turns out it's Windows. This is not like some Linux so where you can just put the pen test monkey PHP reverse shell that we played with. Uh, I made a video, I think on Tuesday or Wednesday, where I attacked a Linux machine. That might not work here. So for that, let's go here. My enumeration, I think I have I have a Windows reverse shell. Let's see. Don't mind my notes, they're all over the place, but they work for me. So uh, for Windows reverse shell, I've I've found a few places where you can go, you know. Um this one I think works, or this one. So if you have um, if you have any tips for Windows Reverse Show, please let me know.
this is the, my go-to because it's again it's a lazy man's uh reverse shell there's uh, other phps that you can you know you can get a web uh command line tool or i've i've shown you on this channel for windows as well but if you want a simple windows reverse shell this one comes with the payload this payload by the way it gets picked up by windows defender like crazy <laughs> so if you don't want to be picked up by windows defender don't use this payload here generate another one was uh when i was testing it earlier windows defender was going nuts seeing this payload here and i think there's probably uh a hash for it on uh virus total and everybody else so what we're going to do is we're going to see okay here's a php reverse show for windows git clone this copy this however you get it to your windows machine it doesn't matter but this is how we're going to break into that windows 10 machine we're going to use this reverse shell and we're just going to customize it and upload it as the avatar image you know just just to be clear let's let's just do the whole thing i don't want to t cut too many corners git clone let's clone this repository here You should already have this i encourage you to have like a slash tools folder where if you use this once you now mentally know you have a windows shell and it's in your slash tools folder so you don't have to clone it every time but for now i'm just cloning it because i like to show you that this actually works gosh i hate folder names that are this big so we have this reverse shell.php I don't like names that are big anyway. So let's copy that. To rev.php. Oh, come on. You see, this is why, like this one is spaces in the naming and my machine is spinning. So once we rename it, we need to change the IP address in it, just like how we do um, PHP reverse shell from pen test monkey. And then of course we just, we, we can just um, get there. Okay. Okay, now we can edit rev.php. What do we need to do with this thing? I was going to use Nisheng today, but um, Nisheng is, we'll use Nisheng next, next week. We have used niching so many times on this channel. I think people got tired of it. So this is something new. 38 dot, uh, what is our IP here? 91. So this is going to be the IP address for Kali Linux. All right. Of course, uh, let's put a different port here. A few things. If you don't want to generate too much noise, use port like 53 like DNS, which I already opened through the firewall. Use ports like uh, 80 or 8080. Th those ones will usually let you out of the firewall. For us, <laughs> I just want to generate a bunch of noise in this thing. So I'm going to use the obvious port 444. 444 is like a default port for most people. So this actually rings a bunch of bells in a network anyway. So we changed our IP address. We changed the port. Let's save this thing. Now we just need to move this to our victim. That's what our proof of concept said. It literally said, hey, you don't have to do much. Upload it. So you don't have to follow all this. This is just, you know, a proof of concept, of course. Your job here is to know how to just read and what this stuff is. And if you are not familiar with this, try Hackme has a bunch of rooms that will teach you about, you know, like web applications and how they work and uh, how you can read this text here. This is like the basics that you need to know, like, Oh, this is just a header and what does header information come with it comes with you know a user agent and session ids and things like that and cookies right now we just, we, are, we are going to, we're not going to even look at that we're just going to say hey we just want to edit this chatbot so let's go to my account somehow 
someone didn't even do any checks or anything. They were like, hey, how about you just upload a picture for our bot? And that picture could be in any format. It could be a PHP, JPEG. It could be whatever you want, which is terrible security, right? So you want to uh, browse. Okay, I already moved my reverse shell, my rev.php. My downloads here because that's easier to get to. Then I just open. Update. There is a better way to do this. You can do this via burp suite where you can actually see the request. If you get any errors, you can see. I'm just doing it right now from here, but you should be able to uh, do this from burp suite. And above here, it just said it was successful, which usually, if, it, if your application is not telling you, intercept this request with burp suite and observe in repeater, see how it goes. So according to this, the update worked. What's next? We need to set up a listener. Uh, let's open a new tab. Make it minus L, V, and P. What port do we listen on? The port that we changed in our reverse shell, 4444, right? So now we are listening on port 4444. We just need to trigger the shell and hopefully it comes back. Yeah, so hopefully we get a shell here. There's a few ways you can do this. First, you go back to a proof of concept. Did they tell you? <laughs> this proof of concept is not clear. In fact, this proof of concept, ah, you know what? I should have done the one that they did. Maybe I will. If I have time, I'll put this one. This is a um, this is a web, uh, a web shell that they showed us here. I just cut to mine. So maybe I should have done the one that they they did. Okay, so I'm I'm forget forget for, forget the one that they had. Let's let's use a different one. All right. So um, when they send a get request web shell, when they send a get, they went to this location here. Right. This is how you know where your shell was saved when you uploaded it. Oh, but. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to this user on the same exact place in the uploads board. Oh, forget that. Let's go back and just see if we can trigger it. We know that the avatar image should be here, right here. This should be the image. So I should be able to right click, reload image or view image. I'm going to say view image. And it hangs. Guess what? It tried to execute our shell. It says executing right here. And let's see if it, we actually got a reverse shell. No, we didn't. Something happened here. Someone help me in the comments. Why didn't I get my reverse shell? I, I know what happened because I already uh, went through this. But I left it in here because it's, good, it's a good learning for you and I. And I'm hoping also my logging is uh, logging this. Something happened here where my browser is telling me Hey, we tried to execute a reverse shell. Oh, wait a second. This is not the one. This one tried to execute on one, two, three, four. But we put four, four, four. So let's go back. Let's go back. Mike says Defender. Yeah, let me, you know what? Let me bring this machine up, up here so I can show you the behavior of Windows when we're trying to execute executables. Our biggest problem is we're executing a file that ends with .exe. Windows Defender doesn't like that. <laughs> so let me see if I can bring you uh, the Windows machine so you can see Windows Defender complaining about this. Uh, this doesn't actually render correctly on this screen. All right, here's our system. This is the victim that we are trying to attack. Look, what, look what's happening here in the background. Threat blocked. Defender doesn't like us. And it's seeing it as a Trojan. 
multiple times actually, because we did it multiple times. And the threat that is detected is actually said here. Oh, we saw this thing, it doesn't work. So there are ways to bypass Defender. One of them is going to be to use Nisheng. Nisheng bypasses this right away because it's just PowerShell. It doesn't save any files, there's no executable. So PowerShell, that's why for me, PowerShell is my tool of choice because if I can do PowerShell commands remotely without putting any executables, I'm in business fi finally. But this is also very important for us to see. This is Windows Defender, it doesn't like us. It's like, nope, you're not, you're not going to run that. In fact, it's tagged as a Trojan. So as attackers, in fact, it actually tells us, you see the name of the file here? It's actually the same as this thing here. I'm expecting Splunk to pick on this. I haven't checked Splunk yet. I'm expecting Splunk to pick on this. Suricata should pick on this. Uh, our intrusion detection should be going crazy because this is a known, um, of course, uh, malicious file that we're using. Hopefully they pick, it, pick on it. All right, let me refresh this and see. All right, so it looks like it's still executing the one that is on um, 1234. So let me see. Let's do this. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. I'm silly. Let's change our port. See? All right. Now let's do it again. This time we should actually get a reversal on our real uh, port. You know, if I were smarter, I would have even changed the name of the file. The fact that this thing is probably going to let me upload the same file with the same name. Actually, I'm not going to say if I was. Okay. We're going to name it shell.php. Change the port. I'm also going to change something here. Forget all this noise. I just want this to be called shell.exe. It's a bad shell. It's not it's, it's not a good one. So you see, I'm just messing with the executable and you know. Everything that I've shown you so far, I didn't do any of it. I didn't write the code for this thing. I borrowed everything from the internet. I just happened to know how to put the pieces together, right? And so far, that's good for good enough. We're script kids uh, that way. All right, I'm uploading the new one. So we can actually see the real deal, not the one that was uh, triggering earlier. It says it up updated. All right. Now let's set our listener. Right click on this thing. View image. Hopefully we're loading the correct one. And we're in. So let's pause for a second. Wait, wait, wait. Time out, time out, time out. The other one. We, we didn't disable Windows Defender. <laughs> Windows Defender is still in action. Someone needs to explain this to me. This one, Windows Defender even had a name for it. The second time I changed the name of the executable file that was uploaded and somehow it worked. What's up with that? If you know, let me know in the comments. I changed, let me show you what I changed if you missed it. 
Because I did get a window a reverse shell here. I'm now on the system. Okay, so this is the original file. This is the file name that we upload to the system. I changed that. And when I changed it, the execution worked. <laughs> when I left it to default, I got caught by Defender. My understanding of Windows Defender was it sees an executable, it tosses it out. Turns out it is used using signatures, or at least it looks like. Was when you saw this name here, it blocked me. Kind of interesting. So it's something that I would like uh, your input as well, if you know what, what happened there. But I, I got a reverse shell. So let's go to our reverse shell. Who am I? Oh, I mean, as Vagrant. Uh, who am I? Such all. This is a crime against humanity right here. If you do this, oh, I hope I don't get kicked out of YouTube because of this. If you do this as an administrator, this is, this is terrible. You are running a vulnerable chat application as administrator. Was we are in as Vagrant, of course, but if you look at Vagrant's permissions, this one is by far the biggest one, right? NT authority. So technically, if you do this, you have owned the whole domain. From here, you can just request the administrator hash, pass the hash to the domain controller, and you can get around. But so far we're in is um, that user. We don't have a password for anybody yet. We don't have anything other than the application that let us in. So we don't have persistence. We don't know much. And we don't want to keep repeating what we did there. So, and we also don't want to create users. If you create a user, you might get caught. So where you go from here depends on who you are. But before I... Uh, run any domain specific information. I want to show you the who am I slash o command that I ran. It's going to show you which groups you belong to. In, in better environments, you're not going to see administrator or anything like that. You're going to have really limited privileges. But this time we see even set backup privileges here, which is kind of interesting. You just have like a very few, like, you know, allowed remote um, access, maybe backup users or something like that. If you hit a jackpot and you show up this way, someone really has terrible security hygiene and they just don't care or they don't know what they're doing, really, because they shouldn't run a chat application as administrator on a system. Like if you, the user shouldn't belong to this group here. But that's, this will not stop us from enumerating today anyway. We are already in here. Let's go and see. We have done so much noise here. I don't know if my security onion is actually capturing. Let's see if I caught anything here. I hope I did. All right, we are capturing stuff in Security Onion. So we are really in business here. This is nice. This makes me happy. Back to our drawing board. We have two types of de detection that's happening here. We have network detection where traffic that was coming from here, moving through the switch, was mirrored here. Big organization will not use switch mirroring because that's not uh, scalable, especially when you have a lot of traffic, they'll probably have expensive network tabs that supports 10 gigabits or something better. But hey, for my lab here, I'm just mirroring port from here to here. It's the same concept. Sometimes people do port mirroring if they don't care about packet loss. But if they are very serious and they really want to see everything, they'll use beefy tab um, that they use. So what we can see right away is um, security onion saw traffic. So um, how do I know? I see these uh, potential VT uh, scans here. 
These are from uh, Nmap. All these right here. That's what we kind of picked up. That's Nmap right here, which was picked up. So I should be able to refresh this and see even more interesting stuff. So in addition to that, on each host, on the, on the Windows 10 machine, on the domain controller, we have Splunk forward uh, for events. So we're forwarding events. Uh, we're actually using Windows event forwarding on a, on a third host here. But we have Sysmon data. We have PowerShell events being forwarded. We're also looking at Windows event logs using Win, WinLog. So if we go to Splunk, all of our indices here, let's change this time to, okay. All, all time is fine. It's a very small lab. Don't, don't do this in a production environment. This will take forever to load. So we have two types of detection. Everybody does this. Any employer who is worth their salt, we have host-based detection, network-based detection, because especially if they have the resources. So right here, as you can see, um, we are looking at all indices, but let's do indexes equals to Sysmon. What did Sysmon see? Especially the most recent kind of stuff. We're just looking here. We are not even doing anything serious, right? We're just saying, oh, what, what does Sysmon event uh, look like? Yeah, we, we can change this to the last minute, uh, last minutes as well. So we can see Windows Event Forwarder is actually forwarding um, Sysmon events here, which is nice. We can look for Win Event Log. These are Windows Event Logs. These ones should show me those executable files that I was messing with earlier that our Windows Defender was talking about. So I would say, I don't know, last four hours. This is uh, all Windows Event Logs that we are seeing. If you're not comfortable with this, you might have to spend some time and just keep looking. The, win the computer name that sent this is Windows Event Forwarder because we have a uh, Windows Event Forwarder uh, server that is actually forwarding events here. All right. So we do have a bunch of events that are coming here for detection. In addition to um, our network-based events, which is really nice because then you can see everything in this. If we go back, I actually just have on the main tab here, this actually comes with the detection lab that I showed you earlier. PowerShell logging. So far, we haven't done any of that. But also, you can look for the uh, PowerShell index. But I want to show you how everything looks from the main one. All right. <laughs> to begin with, here's the events that we saw with Sysmon. For PowerShell, this is what PowerShell saw. We actually didn't run anything interesting here. I don't think that's from us. Oh, look. <laughs> this is the quota. This is how much we have used, so we might not actually see much. Damn it. 0.488, how, how, is this, how does this thing work? Does this mean that we're past the quarter? I don't know. Anyway, we have PowerShell logging as well. And as you, like I said earlier, attackers like PowerShell. I like PowerShell. I wouldn't use uh, executables if I get an option. So we can also have logging happening here. So let's see what we can find. I'm going to just open Kibana. which is the same as this one. I like Kibana better. I'm familiar with Kibana and I spend some time in Kibana. I know I'm sending too many events. I don't, I don't know if I actually, if I um, caught some of my traffic or if I'm being limited now. Again, one more reason why you should use Secure Onion more <laughs> because there is no limits there. Uh, so this is loading. Hey, BT, let's construct a, let's look for all executables that were seen by Splunk and see if we can see our ex executable uh, in action. 
So if you have any insights on how we can do that, let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to make it up. <laughs> Index is close to everything. What fields do I have for all the in indices? I actually saw someone doing really cool things here. First, if you don't know how to use this, you can look at the interesting fields here, which, which, will, be, which will make your life easier. Right. In the interesting field here, well, if, if you have all the indices, that might not be as fun because that's way too many. You have the subject, the source, the signature. Oh, let me see. Account was successfully logged in. That's interesting. I don't want to go in goose chases. I want to stay on process. A new process was success, uh, created. Interesting. What is this? This is me looking at a squirrel and just going, I, I don't know what I'm looking at here. Okay. This is not what I was hoping to see. All right, let's go back. Let's do what BT said. Index. This is a very broad search though. We send our thing as shell.exe. That's a very broad search, but yeah, hopefully we see it. Oh jeez. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, Is that what it says, target file name? All right, so this is our file. Oh yeah, I did name it nasty shell, nasty underscore shell.exe, which is very interesting. Look at, look at this thing here. So we, we did see it a couple of times, uh, we know This is very interesting. I thought this was in the temp folder, but that's actually not what it did. Interesting. All right, let's look for the other one that we uploaded, rev.exe. Of course, when we uploaded it, it was the name was changed. What happened to my rev.exe? Oh, rev.php. That's that's interesting. What happened to my rev? Maybe maybe we didn't we didn't catch when we did. Okay, this is the one that I really wanted to show you. So when we uploaded the file, we uploaded it to this right here, this location on our um, ZAMP server, on our web server. This is where it really set. And you can tell when it was actually uploaded here, the time, the creation, the user, the Vagrant user here, which is, which is kind, of, kind of interesting. BT says rev star. Ah, man. No, this, 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 there's too much. Oh, wait, I see Windows Defender here. Maybe it's because Windows Defender blocked me so many times. Yeah, my, my, my rev file was uh, blocked by Defender way, so, way too many times. Oh, okay, okay, okay. 
This is when I ch I changed the Windows Defender. I did disable Windows Defender earlier. This is an entry showing the uh, Windows Defender being being uh, disabled. I was like, what happened here? That was Windows Defender being disabled. All right. So in addition to this, this is from the host base. So you can tell from the victim that was attacked what uh, really happened. If if I knew how to actually do this the right way, I'm pretty sure that there's someone who does instant response every day. They're probably turning like, dude, <laughs> this is how you did. Anyway, we can see that we do have, um, we, we saw our PHP here. We saw um, our events. What about from the network perspective, right? From the network perspective, look here. I started my live stream after 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. And this is when my uh, firewall, of course, came online. You can see the spike in events. I was running um, Nmap without even worrying about things. I think I also ran GoBuster here. So, of course, um, I generated a bunch of noise, as you can see here. This spike here is from me running all those tools. But, but if I do an... Is it a... Let's do a destination... port we usually do uh we, we said 444 right we should see every time when our reverse shell showed up you would know this from your host your host to say hey we reached out to this when we ran this command and then you can come in here and see oh when did we see 444 showing up in in our connections this perspective here it's very important to know. Perspective that we're looking at in Splunk is from Windows 10. Perspective that we're looking from here is from this switch here. What passed through the switch? Coming down here. That's what we are looking at. What we are looking at earlier is what this machine saw and it forwarded everything to here for analysis. It's kind of important to know like the architecture for these things. Otherwise, you just be doing things without understanding like how it's set up. Okay. So if I go to my discover here, I do see that I did run, um, of course, on 444. Interesting enough, this didn't trigger any Suricara events. I'm kind of disappointed by that. But at the same time, we did get um, broken events. So you can set up like, hey, if you see port 444, which you should have a rule, by the way, Connecting anywhere in your network because 444 is by default the one that comes with a lot of payloads on the internet. You should have a rule. I don't have a rule here. But we can look at this and say, okay, what happened here? It's a connection event from Zig uh, perspective. And of course, if you look at the source and destination, this should match. The destination was 192.168.3891. That's my Kali Linux machine to put uh, 999, then we should have source of 199. So we know this is actually what happened here. We can also search for http.uri keyword. I think this keyword should also show, show us. Just in case it changed halfway through. <laughs> Let's see if we can catch it from here. And sure enough, we are now combining Splunk and the network traffic coming from uh, Zeek to really confirm our story here. Before we go around and freak everybody out on the network and t uh, have people panicking and got getting waking up at two in the morning, we now have a full story like, hey, something nasty is really happening on our network here. Uh, we do see... <laughs> Someone uploaded this shell.php uh, file here. I'm seeing it here from the network perspective. I'm seeing it in Splunk on the host that it actually made it to the host and it was executed. So we might be in trouble here because <laughs> I see it, I see it uh, on both sides. I think the commands was this one. So I'm seeing the same traffic on the host is saying, hey, we did we did ex execute this. 
right here. <laughs> this made it to our ex to our same share. I also see it on the network. So we might be in a lot of trouble here. That's just our detection happening. As far as our default rules and how they, sh they should have fired, uh, looking at these here, network detection was kind of weak here. It didn't catch anything. So there is room for you as a defender to make sure that you have some rules that really catches. If somebody's just moving executable files within your network and the executable files are just getting reverse shells, maybe we can improve here by making sure that if we could see those uh, password hashes, maybe we can do a, you know, some detection based on the known hashes using Suricata. In this case, uh, we didn't do that. All right, BT is saying uh, source like table source at destination IP. Oh, you want you want to just see all the actions that happened. That makes sense. All right. So that was some of the detection part. Someone is probably sitting here thinking, well, what do we what can we do as far as the domain is con concerned? Like, what can we do on the domain? Let's get back into Kali. Are we still in there? Yeah, we are still. Oh yeah, the shell is not stable. Really? This is why when you get here, you need to get out of there as fast as you can. There's a few things that you can do here. First, I hate this shell. Like, look, I cannot clear my screen. It's just unstable. You can bring your netcat here and try to get a better shell using netcat. Or you can... There's, there's, there's so many things you can do. I, I don't want to go there. I, I just want to maybe, let, let's keep it here. I was going to say, let's bring Misheng and get a better shell, but I think I can I can do what I want from here. I'm already in the temp directory. What else, what, what other noises do I have in here? Jeez, this temp directory is noisy. This is the file that we put in here. The nasty shell.exe, remember? That's the one that got caught. Let's see, um, as far as Active Directory is concerned, uh, someone actually sent me PowerView. So I'm going to do it with you today, right now, because I think that it, that would be kind of cool. I, I haven't tried it, so d d don't hold me uh, uh, to this. I'm looking for a resource so I can share. This one or this one? I like this one better. So I found this really nice guide. I mean, the internet is great. <laughs> if you know how to follow a few instructions, before you know it, you'll be there. So here's some infrastructure pen testing. Uh, in this case, it's just a exploitation part. You can use a RPC client, but I was hoping to use uh, let's say, do I have power view? No, before I do power view, let me just run the regular uh, PowerShell command without putting any tools yet. So you get instructions like this, like, hey, here's how you do SPN uh, scanning. I didn't want to just show you this as if this is my own thing. Because I'm, I'm not doing that. You, you can... Um, Go through this and say, okay, so far you can do an SPN scanning by just running regular commands, or you can bring SPN.exe. I don't want to bring any tools. I just want to run um, PowerShell right now. Uh, this one involves another one. All right, I guess, I guess we're, we're doing it. <laughs> So we have this two here. Uh, I'm having second thoughts about running this one. I want power view. Let's use power view. Forget this thing. The reason why I want power view is because I want PowerShell logging to get caught as well. I like to do things that get caught. <laughs> 
So this is now you and I experimenting unscripted stuff. This is the GitHub repository for PowerView if that's loading. Yeah, living off the land is the best, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why this thing is taking forever. Let's bring another one. Okay, let's look at the documentation for PowerView. So if you're like me and you're like, okay, what do we have here? You read like, hey, PowerView is a powerful partial tool to gain network situation awareness on a Windows domain. You need to make sure you exploit the system first. That's why I showed you like, hey, could be anyway. So once you get there, that's when we can get PowerView there. But it comes with all these functions. I mean, it's insane. Look at this. Get domain zone, get get DNS records, get the domain, get domain controller. So we're, we're, going, to, we're, we're, we're going to catch a few of these if, if I can get my power view to load from GitHub here. So we have a bunch of modules. So once you break on a Windows machine and you know that it's joined to a domain, you need to bring a tool like PowerView or something like this. Oh, there we go. It just said to take a, a, a few. So here's um, our script. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right, so here's our PowerView. It's a PowerShell script that we can get from GitHub. We're going to really break it down in, into a, a, a lot of things, but we need to at least look at it before you run it. All right. So right now we, we see that there's a few modules that this person made. And these modules that you, you see here, they, they correspond to what we saw in this documentation here or some functions. All we need to do is get this PowerShell script to our victim. <laughs> yes, realize that our victim uh, once we get there, our victim is actually going to run PowerView. Okay, let me find better documentation here. I think somebody sent me this. I need to make sure that it's not confusing for anybody. Give me one second. Let me look here in our notes. Um, I found really good documentation that makes it like, there we go. It always, almost every time, it always has, it has to point down to hacking articles. All right, there. Now we now we are talking. If you want uh, explanations, the here's here, here's how to, it will all uh, go. You will get all the help that you need from here. It will explain like, hey, how does it work when you run get net user? It will show you the users. I'll show you the users as well. But for now, yeah, I like I like this documentation better because it, it actually explains everything that you need. So after I'm done here and you're like, what was he doing? This is actually going to be better for you. Yeah, hacking articles is a lot of really cool, cool stuff. All right, so this is the article that I encourage us to use because there's really solid explanations as well with PowerView. And we know that it's in here. But before I clone this, I need to make sure that um, I check, see if I already have it. Chances are I do. Cancel that. Quit. I mean, how often do you um, get to see someone have a domain, exploit a web app, and think that they can do things <laughs> live like this? This is crazy.
Oh, no, no, no. Let's go and find, find partial. I told you I might have it. How do I know that I might have it? Look, I have used it on a machine called Crossroads. I think this machine was, was it a tri me machine? This must be, I don't know. This might be a tri me machine. So let's copy this power view that I already have. You can git clone this from uh, the repository. Uh, you know what? I'm not feeling like copying this right now. I'm going to use what when it's whatever it's whenever it is. Really? How hard is it to just copy a path? All right, we're going to copy power view from here. So, that looks like it. I just looked at the end of it. All right, let's do an HTTP. Come on, okay. Crap. I like to start my server when I can see the name <laughs> so I can actually do it right. All right, so let's use um, file transfer. What do you think? Instead of set you to, let's, let, let's use file, um, PowerShell today. So we're going to try to see if we can use PowerShell. 192.168.38, uh, I think 79. This is why I like to have it like that. So we need to, to download this to our victim. And I'm going to try to use PowerShell so, I can, so it can get caught. But set util is probably there. All right, fingers crossed. Can we call PowerShell and download this object here? First, what do we have here? We have a bunch of noise. I don't like this. Oh, I guess it doesn't matter. Let's do it. We just have to look for our file in there. Right away, I just want to emphasize, even regardless of which user you are, you need to go to C, Windows, Temp, that's where you can put malicious files. Everybody can write here. This is just like the temp directory in Linux. So let's see if this runs. I can tell right away it's not going to run. It's not going to run. And guess what? My, my first suspect quotes. But the other thing is, even though we ran it and it failed, Splunk caught this one too, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, this time what happened? Missing argument list. Do I have syntax error in my uh, PowerShell?
What's wrong with this command? Forget it. I think we can do wget. I'm just trying to try something other than set util here. I believe we can do wget. Can't we? There's only one way to find out. And every time you do this, you're getting logged, by the way. Hey, that was quick. Oh, yeah. Mm, powerview.ps1. See Windows temp. Oh, the PS1. All right, I'm not going to waste your time. I know set you two works, so I'm just going to use set you two. Then I figure out what's up with my syntax later. We use that. All right, so it's going to be powerview.ps1. Get that. That should work. <laughs> that might be interesting if... Oh, finally somebody tells me something. Oh no, access is denied. Head defender, talk to me. Let's see. This doesn't work well. <laughs> I know how to move files, trust me. <laughs> it's just kidding me. All right. So we don't have a firewall blocking us here. I disabled that. Okay. I think this is where I went last time. Anyway, I, th I think Defender is blocking me Oh, Let's go back. So we did set it to that file, that file, access denied. Did you try to reach it at least? Nope. Hmm. We have to get the file here. That's that's now our our, our new um, mission. We have to get power view here, and this will get you. So access is denied. Hmm.
Oh no, I, I never ran set you two on, on this one. I'm thinking. How do we bypass that? Let's try one more time. Go back here. It's too bad this cuts it on, on the screen so you can't see the full, uh, at least I can't. All right, I'm going to move it here very quickly. I'm going to be so mad if my are uh, you kidding me? <laughs> ay, 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 Okay. <laughs> Don't mind me. Really. Don't mind me. Ah, this is, this is, this is just, here I am trying to get a, a file from a non-existent host. Hey, ah, Mike, thanks a lot. I owe you a beer. I was, I was like, why? This should be a no-brainer, right? Mike is like, hey, are you sure that's the, even the correct IP for Kali? All right, so we are listening here. Let's get our file there. All right, this time it should work. Uh, HTTP. Let's see, Windows temp. It's still saying access denied, but I was putting the wrong IP last time. So I'm going to give my tools a chance. So it doesn't like the no parent thing magic. Okay, double gear doesn't work. Back to PowerShell. Windows temp, powerview.ps1. Okay, so this one. I have no idea. Last call, file name. Yeah, it shouldn't, the syntax should be fine. And port 80, set details, that file. Okay, so since set two didn't like to work, let me see my other options here. Da, 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 da. 
Good idea. Let's try a text file. So Sergio Tio doesn't like us. We need to one six eight fit it dot ninety one. See Windows temp. Get that path. Okay, that one doesn't work. Now I'm really I'm really committed to make sure that this actually works. <laughs> ah. All right. I promise this is the last one. I'm I'm going to see if I can just do one last thing. This is where, like what I said earlier, like stabilizing your shell should be <laughs> your first priority. I think I'm just being messed up here. I'm going to bring my good friend Nisheng. Remember from all these machines where I've used it? We're just going to use it again. We're going to get a better shell. I don't know why it's not giving me the same permissions. But I'm going to copy it here. So, um, We're, we're, we're becoming more evil now. Uh, I think we're 91. All right. We're getting more evil now on uh, 66666. I'm just hoping I get a better shell that actually has the right privileges this time. Was for whatever reason, I don't think this shell is stable. So with that, we execute Nisheng. I didn't think it would come back to Nisheng, but I will try. This one here, we try to bypass execution policy. That's what I think. That's exactly what I think here. PowerShell execution policy is not set and it's really, is it this one or this one? Must be the same thing. Let's see if PowerShell even runs with this one. We we'll know because it will reach out to here. Look at that. 
I mean, this has to be the coolest thing. Come on, guys. I'm, 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 I'm struggling for you here, showing you the real struggles. <laughs> Look, this time we did reach back. Uh, we got a 200. So I should have gotten a new shell then. No, not yet. But we learned something. <laughs> We learned something here. This script contains malicious content that has been blocked by your antivirus software. Finally, it's talking after I told it to bypass. And uh, Mike, Mike, Mike is here saying, oh, I've been saying this all this time. <laughs> so yeah, so now we know. It's not, it's not the commands that I'm running here. It's the damn uh, Windows Defender, which is blocking my... Uh, my firewall, my my events. So we need to find a way to um, bypass antivirus. I, I'm, I'm not qualified to, to show you that. But at least what you saw here, someone said, <laughs> this is what real pen testing is like. Now we know antivirus will block even your um, malicious software. But this time, look what happened. It, we actually did get a 200 here. So we know it removed the file. All right. So in that case, I'm going to uh, say maybe let's table this for next week. I don't want to just go and just disable uh, Windows Defender right now. Then that will not help us. <laughs> but I think that from the struggles that we have gone through today, quick summary, we went through and we exploited a machine that's sitting on a Windows domain. It's a Windows 10 machine. It does have Windows Defender. So we are able to get on this machine. Right now, we cannot get through Windows Defender to get our power view to the victim. Because it's removing PowerShell, it's removing executables. So what we need to do is bypass the uh, uh, Defender, get power view here, then we can enumerate the domain. But I'm just going to say, let's not get power view there today. I, I, I'm over that. I tried a few times. I think it's very important for us to go and see the logging here. What happened? when we're making those mistakes as a pen tester or as an attacker, as you are experimenting with someone's network and you're messing with them and your commands are failing, let's go track them down. I'm pretty sure the PowerShell ones will be here because I'm logging them all. If I'm not already out of uh, data within Splunk. Yeah, look at this noise. Even the, the exact commands that I ran are in here. So, if you are going to be experimenting on uh, someone's network <laughs> and you're getting a bunch of errors, just because your command didn't run uh, or complete doesn't mean anything. If they have an intrusion detection system like what I have here, you will get caught. So, here's a one way it errored out was I was putting, uh, I don't know what the error was there. Uh, this is all PowerShell logging, by the way. Here's my PowerShell uh, command that I did again as I was trying to. Why am I showing you this? This is very important for those who are doing investigations, right? If someone is in your network and they're messing with your um, systems and you have PowerShell logging, you will be able to go and search for these things and really conclusively know that they were doing this. And in this case, it, it makes sense if you have a company of 5,000 computers it makes sense to put this on servers that are running critical infrastructure, like you know your domain controllers. You want to, if you, if if any of you guys who are sitting on this uh, live stream is a system administrator, and you administer Windows systems, you want to enable um, PowerShell logging, and you have a place where you can actually look at those logs later in, in all your critical systems, mail servers, um, web application servers, but very important domain controller. So we did see this here, which was kind of interesting, even though it failed. So the fact that it made it here, that means that our network intrusion detection system also caught it. So let's go ahead and give it a chance. First, let's check the alerts. Come on, Surikara, you should have seen some traffic moving, right? This is the last thing I'm going to show you today. <laughs> we have to see these things. I 
I can I can do things like this because I can. This is not in a URI though. This was actually I should have PowerShell events here. My window needs to be refreshed. Forget the, let's just do this. You can't do this in production. <laughs> if you do things that I'm doing here in production, I'm not responsible. You cannot be using wildcards like the way I'm doing here. It doesn't really work well, it doesn't scale. Oh, it, it is a time that's set here. Let's change it. All right, someone says, um, when you will be live next time, um, Every Sunday at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, I try to be. So every Sunday at 9 or later, see what I was saying. So <laughs> again, here is, why, why did I go for the um, PS1 extension? Because that's the PowerShell extension that I was doing. And I'm coming from my HTTP web server. That's why uh, I knew it would be there, because I am not encrypting that. So here's a get shared with PS1, and sure enough, this shared with PS1 is the one that made it all the way uh, here on page two, I believe. Or Splunk probably gave up on indexing it, but it made it over here. So detection works 100% for sure. I'm very happy about how uh, this lab here, especially with this setup uh, that we have, does detection. It's like there's so much that we can cover and there's so much you can learn and it's just like endless. So if you want to learn, please set up a lab like this. Just mess around and goof around like I'm doing here with you. It will be really, really fun and you learn a lot. Obviously, I have a lot to learn as well. But for now, since we wasted a lot of time trying to move a file, uh, I just want to thank you for stopping by. Next week, we'll be focusing on Power View. I'll still have... Um, something vulnerable on, on a client, something very simple next time. It won't be a web, a web or something like that. Probably like a share that we can enumerate using RPC client, then get in. So starting next week, we'll be coming from a client, like a Windows 10, enumerating the domain. We are not going to be attacking the domain controller. And this is awesome stuff. So if you like this, and if you are like a system administrator, or you're going for the OSCP, or you just like to hang out with me, um, please, Make sure to come back next week. We'll be here. Otherwise, I really want to thank you very much for being here. And thanks for enjoying and seeing me struggle trying to move a file when damn Windows Defender was blocking me. But hey, it's a lesson for you and I. Windows Defender does work, apparently. And we'll see that next week again. Otherwise, thank you very much. I have to go to bed. Otherwise, uh, see you later.